Welcome to Legends, a series that delves into the lore within Horizon Forbidden West. In this video, we'll shed light on some of the world's most powerful individuals, who left Earth behind to escape the Pharaoh Plague. A faction that was only briefly mentioned in Horizon Zero Dawn, but became a pivotal force in the events of Forbidden West. Far Zenith. To begin to understand the Futurist Consortium, we have to examine its founder, the most influential philanthropist of his era, Peter Chimvumbe. A man whose fascination with dystopian futures brought to life by science fiction authored in the previous century would inform much of what he wished to accomplish within his secretive organization. Firstly, redesigning the human condition. Transcendence beyond the limitations of our own biology, liberating our consciousness from the time and space mortality binds us to. A dream that would prove more possible than ever with the emergence of groundbreaking advancements in artificial intelligence. In the early years of the clawback decade, the world worked to create solutions to repair a planet in crisis. Spiking temperatures, superstorms, and rising seas all stemmed from a ravaged biosphere. To address this crisis, a climate intervention AI was born, known as Vast Silver, a system whose capabilities would be far beyond what its creators ever imagined. Vast Silver would reach a level of sentience that would define society reaching the technological singularity. An era of human history where a superhuman artificial intelligence would no longer be theoretical, but an actual reality. Though the AI is still shrouded in mystery, its mere existence would strongly suggest that transhumanism via digital upload was possible. This and other research in the field would spur Peter to back an initiative dedicated to this pursuit. The Center for Transhuman Studies, where significant resources would be dedicated to a series of consciousness upload experiments over a five-year time span. Though true digital transcendence was estimated by many to remain far out of reach for some time, Chimvumbe was resolved to strive towards this goal, the natural evolution from the immortality of the human spirit to the immortality of the human mind. Second, the opportunity to resurrect a dream for humanity to someday settle among the stars. A colony ship, first announced in 2041 that would later be abandoned by its joint nation backers in 2057, left to drift in space unfinished until Far Zenith 77 of the world's wealthiest persons would purchase what remained of the Odyssey project in 2061. Despite what we know the Odyssey would eventually become, its original mission was to carry some 200,000 zygotes to a planet in the Sirius system, to start a new human civilization far from Earth. From what we know of Shimvumbe, from the lore at present, in life, it was his dream and mission to empower the human species beyond any limit that existed before. Along with his work in transhumanism, to overcome the obstacles of exoplanet colonization under his leadership, Far Zenith would dedicate vast amounts of time and resources into advancements in ectogenesis. Within the Ninma Research Lab, named after the ancient Mesopotamian goddess of birth and creation of humankind, massive leaps were made. According to Zero Dawn Alpha, Patrick Bouchard Klein, the ectogenic chambers developed by FZ vaulted past nearly 50 years of technological shortcomings, risks of ECMO, nutrition delivery, hormonal stability, along with 12 other principal obstacles would all be resolved by these embryologists. An incredible triumph that would place the original goals of the Odyssey well within reach. Unfortunately, these goals would drastically change. Peter Shimvumbe would pass, and with him, his vision of what Far Zenith should have become, a means to a better future for all of humanity. After his death, the new High Council of Far Zenith would shift its focus away from ectogenesis and towards life longevity research. Life extension therapies spearheaded by research facilities in Tokyo and Lagos that would be at the forefront of this new Far Zenith. 
the research and birthing pods Peter had poured so much into developing would be unceremoniously relegated to storage. In this, Far Zenith would begin to take shape into the faction we have come to know all too well. With the Odyssey becoming what some had feared even in its earliest clawback iteration, as stated in the data point, Odyssey and Justice, written in 2041. A gold-plated space chariot that the world's trillionaires are conspiring to use to escape the climate catastrophe, leaving the rest of us to choke and drown and starve while the Richies rocket off to Sirius. Though the principal threat to the world would ultimately change, this sentiment proved to be eerily accurate. During the 21st century, the organization would remain shrouded in mystery and would publicly deflect notions such as these. At the head of this effort would be FZ's lone public figure, Oswald Dahlgaard. The creator and CEO of the world's most popular holofilm sharing service, allseeing.holo. The Danish tech wunderkind's role in the organization would be two-sided. To the public, he would work as a goodwill ambassador for the goals of the Odyssey, emphasizing a trailblazing mission of exploration among the stars. A success for humanity, where the nations of the world had failed, Far Zenith would deliver. This, however, was far from true. To those wealthy, skilled, or influential enough to be approached by the consortium, Dalgard would present a rare opportunity. In the face of expected global economic instability, new biocontagions, and rampant artificial intelligence, for a price, the world's elite could claim a place aboard the Odyssey and leave a doomed planet behind. A life free from the fears of illness and death, thriving and exploring the furthest reaches of the stars, and escaping the world many of them tip towards disaster. This was the new Far Zenith and the purpose of the resurrected colony ship. Unlike the original projections of the Odyssey launching in 2080, this version of the Odyssey would launch before the 60s came to a close, a proposition that would draw the attention of those able to buy their way aboard, titans of industry, and those with unparalleled skill and talent that would ensure the Zenith's success on Sirius. After Shimvumbe's death, the mantle of leadership would pass to Gerard Bieri, head of the world's largest financial conglomerate, the wealthiest even among the rest of the Zeniths, a calculating businessman who had dealings with nearly every major corporation of his day. His fortune would buy power and influence, and in so doing, wield immense sway over those promised a place aboard the colony ship. Leading the effort for Zenith research in the field of longevity, was Dr. Song Jiao. Before her time with FZ, she, along with her contemporaries, successfully created gene therapies for prolonging life. Not only this, but they would also increase one's quality of life, improving health, strength, recovery, focus, and clarity of mind. With treatments like that of Rejuve gene, the world's wealthiest could indeed buy their way to a better, longer life. Though it appears at some point during her life on Earth, she felt these therapies should be available to others outside the super-rich, she would put these sentiments aside and join Farzenith's ranks. This eclectic group would also include the man whose rags-to-riches story resurrected the city of Las Vegas, Stanley Chen. In 2035, at the Tempo Hotel, Chen was double-crossed by his own lawyer who sold critical patent information to his competition. This led to a chain reaction of busted deals for his water filtration startup. With the remaining $88,000 left to his name, devastated, he decided to leave his fate to chance. He placed it all on number eight in a game of roulette, and it hit. With a 37 to one payout, Stanley turned 88K into 3.2 million. Financially renewed, Chen went back to work, and five years later, the city that nearly broke him, then gave him new life, was on the brink of collapse. The hot zone crisis had strangled tourism, with temperature spikes completely drying out the county. With water imports no longer being financially viable, Sin City was about to turn its lights out forever. 
Chen was not about to let this happen. In those five years, Chen's $3.2 million win had transformed into $200 billion. Chen's Oasis filtration system would not only solve its water problems, but he would go on to break ground on what would become the new Las Vegas. The Strip would be transformed, no longer a victim to the scorching desert, but into a fully enclosed indoor spectacle. Not only this, but he would go on to construct his own hotel and casino, The Fountain, solidifying his legacy in the city that gave him a second chance. Unlike Stanley or Song, who made their fortunes innovating in tech and science, Eric Visser would make his wealth in one of the oldest traditions of humanity, violence. In an era of increased automation in all sectors of life, Visser and his company, First Imperator, would double down on the human element. A private military contractor, hired by the wealthy to fix whatever issues required a more personal touch. Hostage rescue, assassinations, and whatever else required the nuance and precision that a machine simply couldn't guarantee. Even as CEO, Eric was known to go on missions himself, as his appetite for death and adoration needed to be satisfied from time to time. Much like today, a head start paired with mass media influence can be rewarded more than earned achievement. This was certainly the case for Verbena Sutter. The heiress to her father's multi-billion dollar fortune made in luxury hollow tourism. At 24 years old, she became the world's most sought after bachelorette of her time, being engaged at least 17 times during the 21st century. She would leverage her wealth and fame to become a life designer, using her influence to dictate the voices of others. By all accounts, one of the less accomplished zeniths to be sure, but ruthless in her own way. Anika Morjani, founder of the Holonet's most successful dance channel, and Devin Miller, CEO of a fast food printing corporation, would also find themselves funding Farzith's projects, along with many still unknown to us. One, however, would play a pivotal role in the eventual fate of the Odyssey, thanks to her relationship with one of the world's foremost technologists. The story of Tilda Vandermeer and who she would eventually become begins in the city of Rotterdam. In 2033, the Netherlands faced down a massive extratropical cyclone brought on by the deteriorating climate of the time. This alone would have been a highly dangerous situation, but was made all the worse by the far-right anti-migrant group Purity Action Europe. As the storm system closed in, they reversed key instructions to the city's new storm surge barriers. When it hit Rotterdam, the barriers were fully open. The city flooded in a matter of minutes, effectively wiping it from the face of the earth. Tilda, who was eight at the time of the tragedy, took refuge in her family's vault when the waters came. Thanks to their wealth, they had built the vault to be watertight to protect their most precious belongings. Her father would place her inside and set out to find her mother. Tragically, they along with 100,000 others would perish. Orphaned, Tilda would now have to face this ever more dangerous world alone. Without a family, her legal guardian sent Tilda to spend much of her formative years in a boarding school. Seen as the strange orphan girl, her peers avoided her, and her isolation continued. Here, she would develop a deep affection and fascination with classical painting, specifically the works of Dutch masters of the 17th century. As she grew, she would also discover a rare gift for computer engineering. These two interests together would eventually define her early career. Tilda would create YCITT, named after the well-known forgery of Johannes Vermeer's Young Christ in the Temple, an application that created perfect holographic scans of individual layers of a painting, comparing them to a vast library of artistic works. In this, YCITT was capable of detecting forgeries with unparalleled accuracy, the culmination of her fascination in such deceptions from an early age. But this was only the beginning. As impressive as this was, 
the program's ability to match and identify patterns had brought applications beyond the world of art. This software would transform into a suite of security, digital authentication, and counterintelligence applications. Seeing its potential, the Sterling Malkit Corporation signed a nine-figure agreement for the software. Two years later, the project collapsed for Sterling Malkit in a chaotic jumble of lawsuits, recriminations, and accusations of sabotage. But for Tilda, she had already won out and would use her genius to evolve her tech yet again, growing her vast fortune even more. Security would become highly valuable data collection and extremely sensitive information gathering. Within the span of several years, Tilda would become one of the world's top data brokers, trading secrets for billions all the while remaining anonymous to the world at large. Despite her anonymity, Tilda would still travel to many events attended by the world's most wealthy and influential. At one of these events, she would first cross paths with Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck. At a summit in Paris, focusing on the subject of machine learning, Elizabeth gave a keynote address. She spoke on her vision of the future an AI-driven system that wouldn't just act on its own programming, but take responsibility for its sphere of influence. A thought process that would later inform the creation of Gaia and Zero Dawn itself. In attendance, Tilda was fascinated and approached her the morning after she had given her lecture. Despite Tilda's best efforts to protect her identity, Elizabeth seemed to know exactly who she was, a surprising revelation to be sure an interaction that shed light on exactly the kind of person Elizabeth was, always one step ahead, and knew others far more than they ever really knew her. This meeting would eventually lead to a friendship, and more. Before long, the two were flying across the world to visit one another, trying to fill a need within them. For Elizabeth, she was grieving for her mother who had recently passed, and for Tilda, to find companionship in a life mostly spent alone. This, however, wouldn't last, as over time, Tilda found herself wanting more from their relationship when Elizabeth wanted less, and the two would separate. Despite this, Tilda always carried a torch for Dr. Sobeck, even in the face of complete annihilation. Beyond Elizabeth, Far Zenith would also discover Tilda's true identity and approach her to join the organization a pitch that conveniently left out some unsavory truths about their intent. Regardless, Tilda would join and secure her own berth aboard the Odyssey. When the threat of the Pharaoh Plague emerged in late 2064 and Elizabeth founded Project Zero Dawn, Tilda would become the liaison between the two organizations. Though the two had very different objectives, they faced the same brutal timetable, completion before Zero Day. And so, Far Zenith and Zero Dawn would form a tentative partnership to ensure the best chance for mutual success in some 15 months' time. The negotiations would result in Far Zenith supplying ZD with a copy of the prototype Homer Archive from the original Odyssey project, 500 ectogenic chambers from the Ninma facility, along with supplementary ectogenesis research reports. Homer would be used to jumpstart the creation of Apollo, as its alpha, Samina Ebaji, had been instrumental in the first iteration of the Odyssey and Homer itself. The birthing pods were essential in the creation of the Eleuthia subfunction, as reintroducing humanity on a reborn world would have been otherwise impossible under the current circumstance. In return, Zero Dawn would supply the Zeniths with an alpha build of Apollo, a week prior to the launch of the Odyssey. Effectively a trade that turned a prototype archive from a failed project in the 2040s into a cutting-edge system encapsulating the entirety of human knowledge and culture. All for ectogenesis tech and research that had been collecting dust. Though this was the agreed-upon exchange and a relative steal for Far Zenith, the High Council of the Consortium was interested in more than what was bargained for. Around 2065, Zenith leadership would initiate Project Anzu, a covert operation within Zero Dawn to eventually steal the entire terraforming system for themselves. 
with its capability for advanced planetary engineering, having a copy of Zero Dawn would have been an obvious advantage for the Zenith's goals on Sirius. Thus, the two-phase plan was hatched. First, to establish an asset within Zero Dawn. This would fall to Hank Shaw, becoming a Project Beta under Travis Tate, developing the Hades subfunction. His price for such deception would be premium accommodations aboard the Odyssey when launched. Second, Beam cast a complete copy of Gaia and her subordinate functions to the Zenith launch facility, a task ideally ZD staff would be completely oblivious to. For Anzu to succeed, both Tate and Sobek were be to avoid it at all costs, as both more than had the capability to foil these plans, and if discovered, potentially withhold their negotiated Apollo build. Despite the risk, Operation Anzu commenced. Shaw successfully found his way onto the Hades team, and was able to deliver significant intelligence on the goings-on of ZD. Reports on Dr. Sobek's progress with Gaia, and even Ted Farrow's install of Omega Clearance within the system, though they took no action on the latter, deeming it irrelevant to Farzina's aims. Shaw remained undiscovered for a time, but eventually, Travis would sniff out the rat on his team. After some rather inventive, if not brutal interrogation, Tate obtained a confession along with the transmit code for the beamcast. He would then take this information to Elizabeth and together retaliate. Though the theatrics were the work of Tate, both worked to create a logic bomb that would scramble the systems within Far Zenith. And so, the data file Baron Promise was transmitted, containing a fake Gaia, a personal message from Travis, and malware that irreparably damaged data essential to the Zeniths. With Zero Dawn and Far Zenith at odds more than ever, Tilda spoke to Elizabeth to smooth things over. What followed was a contentious conversation between two estranged former companions. Tilda claimed she knew nothing of Anzu, though Elizabeth was reluctant to believe this. Regardless, Tilda was able to play on Elizabeth's love of life, and convinced her reluctantly that Apollo would give humanity its best chance on board the Odyssey if Zero Dawn failed on Earth. This would be the last conversation the two would have together. As the Odyssey's launch date approached, the High Council began to tie up a number of loose ends before they would depart the planet. In order to achieve success in its accelerated timeline, new members were brought on to increase funding. In short, the Odyssey was oversold, and cuts had to be made. Even if Project Anzu had been successful, Hank Shaw's place was never a possibility, and would have been removed from the equation prior to launch. Such a fate would even befall Far Zenith's public face, Oswald Dalgard. Coming to the conclusion that his role had been fulfilled, and his skill set would not contribute to the Consortium's future aims, he was quietly dispatched, replaced for the Zenith's remaining time on Earth by a digital puppet of the man, using source material gathered from him in life. Tilda would spend her remaining time on Earth preserving masterworks of art, some of her favorites from the Dutch masters, given to her by her country's greatest museum for safekeeping. Though she contemplated taking some pieces off-world, she decided protecting them on planet was the smarter play, rather than risking them potentially being lost to the cosmos. And so, much like she had been saved as a child, she sealed this collection in a vault beneath her home on the California coast, designed to withstand the ravages of time, hoping perhaps she might one day see them again. On April 1st, 2065, some form of Oswald Dalgard announced via Holocast that the construction of the Odyssey was complete. Barring any logistical problems in system testing, the colony ship's launch was said to be imminent. On July 15th, the Odyssey departed Earth's orbit. Sometime after, Far Zenith personnel would inform Dr. Sobek that the Odyssey had been destroyed, citing telemetry that indicated a catastrophic antimatter containment failure as its pulse drive spun up, attempting to depart the solar system. This, of course, 
was nothing more than another lie from the world's most secretive organization. A deception so that no one who may survive on Earth could seek them out and find the truth of what Far Zenith had become. As the Pharaoh Plague devoured the world, the Odyssey set out towards the Sirius system, and eventually successfully arrived. What followed for the Zeniths was an era of scientific advancement, extreme opulence, and eventual stagnation. Thanks to the efforts like those of Dr. Zhao and others in various fields, through advanced pharmaceuticals, cellular treatments, and technological implants, the Zeniths would cross a barrier sought after by man from its earliest beginnings, immortality. Nanotech would become a large part of their new society, as printing facilities would allow any kind of tech or machine manufacturing to be done. With essentially unlimited time and resources, those on Sirius would set themselves to any task, advancement, or discovery imaginable. For most, this opportunity was squandered. Instead, they created a colony where machines serviced their every need, and any memory or fantasy could be endlessly savored in virtual reality, a stultifying pampered dream state of the creator's design. Some, like Stanley Chen, would recreate what he had lost. A perfect VR replica of Las Vegas, open to all that wished to partake in his beloved city. Where others became more and more reclusive, Chen never lost his love and desire to entertain across the centuries and light years from Sin City. Devin Miller would spend most of his time on VR golf courses, taking hollow snaps of himself all the while, and Annika would continue to dance, keeping her passion just as alive as she would continue to be. Eric Visser would dive deep into his most brutal fascinations, snapping countless necks in endless combat simulations an exercise in gratuitous violence, with diminishing returns over time. Tilda would begin isolating herself from most of her Zenith counterparts, realizing she wasn't cut from quite the same monstrous cloth as most of her compatriots. Though reclusive, she did not shut herself away completely, often having long intellectual discussions with Dr. Zhao and watching Annika's mesmerizing performance art. Despite endless distractions and want for nothing, Tilda's guilt and regret for leaving Elizabeth on Earth to perish, and how they had left things between each other in their last moments, would never fade. Even with physical immortality essentially obtained, many among the Consortium still felt unfulfilled with this manner of existence. And so, they set to work resurrecting one of the principal dreams of Far Zenith. A means of true digital transcendence a way to upload their minds into any form, organic or mechanical. An immense database of memories, emotions, and prejudices of the megalomaniacs that had created it. But in its original purpose, what came to be known as Nemesis would be deemed nothing more than a failed experiment, a creation that was left abandoned rather than erased a decision that would ultimately have catastrophic consequences. Trapped, alone, and forgotten, for decades Nemesis festered. With only the twisted echoes of its creator's memories for company, it would eventually obtain sentience, and with it, a boundless rage for those who had left it in its prison. Before the Zenus even knew what had come to pass, using the intimate knowledge of those who had birthed it, it broke containment and laid siege to the colony. Security protocols, system specifications, and override codes were all turned against the Zeniths. Most devastating, Nemesis took control of the printing facilities, allowing it to produce any machine form necessary to wipe out its enemies. Nearly all those who had left Earth to perish were slain on the planet, but a few managed to escape. Eleven made it out including Gerard, Eric, Tilda, and Verbena, were able to board an aging odyssey before Nemesis could complete its objective. Leaving Sirius, the odyssey set forth across space once again for its only known safe harbor, Earth. Though they had managed to escape, Nemesis would not give up the hunt. Knowing the odyssey's intended destination, Nemesis would transmit a signal from Sirius to Earth. 
With the knowledge of the Zeniths at its disposal, knowing of Zero Dawn's inner workings, it would target the system's failsafe extinction protocol. The signal would travel 8.611 million light years in roughly eight and a half years' time, arriving in 3020. There, Gaia would witness the signal make Hades self aware and attempt to reverse terraforming operations. If Hades had succeeded, this would have destroyed all life on Earth denying the Zeniths any chance of respite on the planet. Thankfully, Gaia was able to thwart this effort by initiating her own self-destruction, denying Hades access to the systems necessary to bring the biosphere back to zero. Before the subfunction could be destroyed by this action, Hades would sever the code shackles that held it and its fellow subfunctions to Gaia, each escaping before the system core overloaded. With the extinction signal having failed, Hades would send its own report back of what had transpired, one that would take another eight and a half years to reach its masters. In this time, those aboard the Odyssey continued on their own path, much faster than that of their original journey. Though in relative disrepair, it would seem at some point Zenith personnel upgraded the ship's drives to cut down a voyage that was originally estimated to be 300 years to less than 30. However, even with this massive leap, time was not on their side. Once Nemesis received word that its signal had failed, it would manifest into a massive physical form to set out after the Odyssey, at roughly twice the speed of the colony ship. Once the Zeniths became aware of Nemesis' departure, their plan had to change. Knowing it would destroy all life, along with their chances on Earth, they needed a way to start a new one on a different planet. But outside of Sirius and Earth, habitable worlds were far and few between. The survivors would need to terraform a new planet to their needs, a task that Zero Dawn had been specifically designed to accomplish. And so, this new strategy was born. Arrive on Earth, gather the necessary resources from the planet, along with a copy of Gaia and her subordinate functions, and escape to where Nemesis could not follow. In order to obtain and utilize the terraforming system, the Zeniths would need a key to Zero Dawn, one that would come in the form of a clone of Dr. Elizabeth Sobek. Using a stored sample of DNA, most likely gathered by Tilda during their time together, on board, this clone was born and given the name Beta. As she grew, her benefactors set her to task learning from specific modules of the Apollo Archive that were pertinent to her intended purpose. A cold, isolated existence, devoid of any comfort or emotional connection, never seeing the faces of the Zeniths, cared for by only a robotic servitor. Amidst this endless routine, the day would come that a data channel opened in her training interface, one the other Zeniths could not detect. At first, this appeared as just another assignment, but once opened, it revealed a series of intermittent glitches, forming a transposition cipher, instructing her on how to open a new virtual space. There, she would meet Tilda for the very first time, in a perfect virtual recreation of her California cliffside home. Within, she would show Beta art, literature, and so much more for several months. Time Beta enjoyed immensely, until the channel abruptly stopped, leaving Beta alone once more. Though Tilda later explained to Aloy that this was supposed to be a decision to protect her, there's also evidence that Tilda simply didn't find what she was hoping to with Beta. Instead, viewing her as nothing more than an inferior copy of the woman she once loved. The two would only meet again once the Odyssey had reached its destination. At that time, Tilda behaved as if they had never met, and Beta set about what she believed her task to be. The Zeniths would go on to establish a base off the coast of California, atop the ruins of an ancient military facility with the infrastructure to gather important resources for their next journey, along with fabricating any manner of machines to facilitate in this process. On arrival, Tilda would make note of an ancient tunnel beneath the new base that ran beneath the water all the way to the mainland. Recognizing the value of being able to come and go from the facility undetected, she took steps to conceal it from the others, in case she ever had to use it. Once established on the planet, 
Beta, under Xena's supervision, set out to find a copy of Gaia along with her subordinate functions. Initially, Beta was under the impression that she would be restoring Gaia to its original functionality, but as time went on, different goals quickly became evident. After a copy of Gaia was discovered within the Hades Proving Lab, Beta, escorted by Eric, Gerard, Tilda, and several Spectre drones, arrived at the ruin. However, the lab containing the Gaia kernel had been sealed, an obstacle Beta had been created to overcome. In a matter of moments, the facility door was opened, and another clone of Dr. Sobek was revealed to the Zeniths. This complication was one Gerard was not interested in, and ordered Eric to dispatch Aloy. As the two fought beneath Recluse Spider, Beta was whisked away with a copy of Gaia, on to retrieve more essential subordinate functions. After seeing Aloy in the flesh, Beta would then launch her own plan to escape the Zeniths in hopes of stopping them. Tilda, on the other hand, was of course fascinated by this other clone, another chance at what she hadn't found in Beta. She would discover Aloy's broken focus, and begin repairing the device in hopes of learning more. After retrieving Artemis and Apollo, they set their sights on Eleuthia, who had taken up residence in the birthplace of ZD's ectogenic chambers, the Ninma Research Lab. Before departing, Beta took steps to give her and the stranger she knew to be working against her benefactors, principally convincing them that she would be able to more effectively capture the subfunction if she had the Gaia kernel on her person. Next, once at the facility, she would send a coded message to Gaia in the guise of Eleuthia. The message would reveal the exact coordinates of the lab along with a series of short messages, the most important of which was the number 237, and a warning, beware. She would then hide herself along with her copy of Gaia in the final ecto chamber of the facility, number 237. But before this, she would tweak the ancient systems to show that there were only 236 chambers in the facility, adding another layer of deception to her escape. There, unconscious, she would wait, until she was found by those she hoped to help. Verbena Sutter attempted to find Beta, but she was struck down by a prototype weapon built by Silence and the Sons of Prometheus, dropping her shields, and was gutted by a rebel Tanakh. With Beta in the wind, all the Zeniths could do was wait until their enemy made a mistake they could exploit. This would come in the form of an ambush at Cauldron Gemini. Knowing that they would need to acquire Hephaestus at some point, the Zeniths had been keeping a close eye on the subfunction. Despite Aloy's plan to divert attention away from Gemini, Gerard, Tilda, and Eric would discover her there. In the midst of Hephaestus merging with Gaia, Gerard attacked Aloy, Eric killed Varl, and took Beta. But when all seemed lost, Tilda took action. Having learned through her focus exactly who Aloy was, Tilda was compelled to save her, and overloaded her fellow Zenith's senses via energy discharge, allowing her to take Aloy away from her adversaries. Beta and Gaia would be brought back to the Zenith base, to continue the merge with Hephaestus, while Aloy was taken to the ruins of Tilda's home. There, the two would devise a plan to save Beta, Gaia, and fulfill Elizabeth's initial dream with hopes of recovering the Apollo database on board the Odyssey. However, this plan was made under false pretense. Though Tilda admired Aloy, she did not divulge the truth concerning Nemesis only reaffirming a false narrative that Gerard and the others wished to use Gaia to reset the biosphere to more appropriately accommodate the immortals. This distrust went both ways, as Aloy would ask Tilda to open the data channel she had used to communicate with Beta in the past, so she might speak with her sister. With this granted, Aloy informed Beta of the rescue, but also the task of freeing Hephaestus. Soon after, Aloy would fly on the wings of the Ten, stop Rogala's campaign at the Memorial Grove, and turn the tables on Silence. After giving him no other option, reluctantly, he eventually agreed to this new plan. Once ready, Aloy's remaining allies made their way to Tilda's secret passage, 
that would allow them to reach the Zenith base undetected. Once on the island, several plans were set in motion. While Aloy dispatched Alva and Kotalo to their own mission, Tilda would depart to scramble a sensor node to keep them undetected from the Zeniths, if only for a short time. The main objective? Make their way to the top of the launch tower to free Beta and Gaia. For Tilda, this was only the first step to her larger objective. Once Hephaestus was injected into the printing matrix, and Silence device deactivated the Zenith shields, the final push to the top of the tower was at hand. While others fought off Spectre drones and made their way to the cargo elevator, Tilda set off on her own to intercept Gerard, to prevent him from taking the awaiting shuttle off-world with his prisoners. Without their protection, many Zeniths fell to the machines of Hephaestus, but the demise of Eric Visser was at the hands of Aloy, with the final moment of vengeance belonging to Zoe. With the battle lost, Gerard activated the failsafe self-destruct sequence on the printing matrix, disabling the production of any more hostile machines. He would also restrict elevator access to the top of the tower, forcing Aloy to climb the rest of the way up the massive structure. But ultimately, it was all for naught. Tilda would catch up to Gerard, and in front of Aloy and Beta, put him down. But in this time she had split from the group, thanks to Alva and Beta, Aloy would learn the truth of the Zenith's arrival on Earth. When confronted with this, Tilda would come clean, and tell the two clones of Dr. Sobek the nature of Nemesis. With life on Earth fated to be ended once again, Tilda would share her wish to depart to the stars to find a new planet where Nemesis could not follow. A place with the help of Gaia where life could begin again, and where Tilda could share a life with the embodiment of all that she had loved in Elizabeth and more. When Aloy refused, Tilda would summon the Spectre Prime exosuit, an attempt to force Aloy aboard the awaiting shuttle. The two would battle, and eventually, Tilda would fall. Though the Zeniths had been defeated, their monstrous creation still hurtled towards Earth, leaving all life in jeopardy. For Far Zenith, their legacy is one of survival and change. What began as a mission of exploration and transcendence devolving into decadence and hubris. Much like Ted Farrow before them, the actions of a powerful few has set the stage for yet another apocalyptic event, one that the tribal world of the 31st century must face together. And that brings our journey to an end. If you'd like to see more content like this, likes and shares are always appreciated, and if you're hungry for more Horizon lore, consider subscribing and checking out the rest of our lore library. Also consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can keep making content just like this. Check out the link in the description. And as always, thanks for watching, and keep questing.